Today on Lockdown Red Wings, Detroit falls 3-2 to two in overtime to the Dallas Stars. And while they got five out of eight points on the road trip, it may not be enough to keep up with the Atlantic Division. Your Locked On Red Wings, your daily podcast on the Detroit Red Wings. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back to the Lockdown Red Wings podcast. We are your hosts, Brian Fisher and Scotty Bentley. I am a podcast producer for the Daily J, WWJ News Radio podcast. Well, Scotty is host over at Lockdown Tigers as well as a freelance journalist for the Detroit News. And uh, first and foremost, in today's episode, we're going to recap the game that occurred on Saturday. We're recording this at like 11 a.m. on Sunday, trying to knock it out so we can go watch those Lions. Um, but about that occurred yesterday, I, um, their 3 2 overtime loss to the Dallas Stars. And then also in segment three, we're going to be talking about Elmer Soderblom getting sent down to the minors and uh, what the implications could behind that could be and why it happened in the first place, our opinions on that at least. Um, but first, Scotty, on Saturday, the Red Wings fell 3-2 to two in overtime to the Dallas Stars, taking a total of five out of eight points on their four-game road trip. That seems pretty good, but what did you think about the game itself? You know, I was... Uh, very impressed with pretty much everything except the giveaway in overtime. <laughs> I uh, I was really impressed, man. I mean, we, we talked about – we were really, really down after that loss to the Panthers. And, like, rightfully so. I, I still stand by all of it. And, you know, I, I think that that is a that, – that, those were all fair points and that was a fair assessment of uh, of the Detroit Red Wings as a whole after that game. But we had mentioned on Friday before the weekend how this was such an important game to prove to not only themselves, but to prove to like the fan base and to everybody that like, hey, this is not the Red Wings of the last four or five years. And even if they get clapped like that and, and they get blown out of the water, they can turn around and still be competitive against a really good team immediately following it. And it's not going to, one loss is not going to turn into three, four, five losses or zero points is not going to turn into zero points over the next four games. Like the, the fact that they were able to, I mean, they were buzzing, man. The, the first period of that game really was similar, I think, to the Tampa Bay game, just in the, the high paceness of it. And so, I, I was I was impressed, and obviously you you want to leave that game with two points, and you put yourself in a position where that was possible. And there was a really bad turnover with like less than a minute left before you got into a shootout. And, to do and we'll so. talk about that. that. Things, obviously, and uh, you know that's that's it's not not a great way to end the game, and definitely you know when when you're going home, that's a sour note. But as a whole, I'm I'm very glad and and very impressed with this team to turn around that quickly and get a point from a division leader. Yeah. I mean, I think I agree with most of your points. I mean, we were watching the same hockey game. So of course we have a lot of the same thoughts on it. The, the Red Wings in this game, like you said, it was, it was um, flavors of the Tampa Bay game. It, it felt very Tampa Bay ish where you're going up against, well, you know, at the time Tampa Bay was a little bit lower in the standings a really a juggernaut of a team in Dallas right now, first in central division Red Wings came out buzzing and they played the first two periods very close. Um, and it was tied through two periods. My problem is, is that this, and this is where you really see the gap between what the Red Wings are and what the Dallas stars are and the Tampa Bay lightning are, is that when it comes down to go like time to go, we got to get going. We got to win this hockey game in the third period. One team can turn it on, and the other team is on their heels the entire time. In the third period in this game as well, the Dallas Stars had 85% share of the quality shot attempts at in even strength. An 85% share. You were dominated again in the third period. And again, the only reason why you made it to overtime was because of Vili Husso. And he was great again in this game, and he made the saves he should have made. And that's all you can ask for your goaltender to give you an opportunity to win. But it just, 
I mean, and I'm not I'm not frustrated by this because I understand that this is the team, but I just want to I want to make it known that like when we're talking about the Detroit Red Wings and what they still have to do to become that legitimate playoff threat, finishing out games is vital. And right now they don't have that in them. Every single time it's it's crunch time, the better team on paper is able to turn it on and have a dominant third period. And the Red Wings just aren't able to do that yet. You saw it in Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay scored two goals with their uh, goalie pulled. And the only reason why the Red Wings uh, won that game is because they had a two goal lead. And every time they pulled within one, they scored an empty net goal to put them up another one. Right. So that's the only reason when you won that Tampa Bay game and in Dallas, it was two to two. You squeaked in overtime, got a point, which is important. It's important to stay alive in the, you know, the playoff race. It's, we're talking about playoff race, not even halfway through the season, but if you want to stay relevant, it's important to get that point, but they were on you the entire time. So, it does get, it, it does like, you look at it and you go, okay, I can t- totally see where this team has to go to improve. And I, again, I'm not frustrated by it because it's, it, it's, it's really eye opening. And I knew this team had flaws yet and they're decimated by injuries, but it's definitely something that I noticed that has been a recurring theme is that they play really good for the first two periods. And then tier three comes along and the better team is going to look like the better team. Yeah. And, and that is, very clear no matter who's in net. Like if, yeah. if <laughs> lately, if net has been in net, then the third period comes along. And it's, I, I don't, I don't want to say a lot more nerve wracking because it's just, it's always nerve wracking, but uh, maybe you see a few more goals let in. And, and, but the, the main point I was trying to make was like when Huso's in net, if he's on in the third, like it, it's almost more clear because he's not letting in goals, like weirdly enough, because you're just getting peppered with shots like well, the, the the you know that's been a, a reoccurring theme for sure but Huso has just been amazing and been able to kind of drag us into overtime or even drag us into victories like in Tampa so yeah that that's definitely been a, a reoccurring theme and and again we talk about all the time like the next steps in development for this team and that's certainly one of them because you're right there's a big difference between hanging with a team that's better than you or hanging with one of the better teams in the league, I guess you could say for the first half of the game or the first two periods versus a, just doing it for 60 in general, but B hanging with them in the third period when their backs are against the wall and they're getting desperate. And that's something that the the wings have certainly yet to really prove that they're on that level and capable of doing that. This game was also weird in the sense that, both of these teams were like the poster children for odd man rushes or just rushes in general yeah. and like fast breaks and everything. Like they, they showed the a stat goal. during the game Bally did, right? They showed a stat that the stars had one of the fewest, I want to say like 28th in the league or something like that. And, uh, offensive zone time, but yet they're in the top of the league and like scoring and shots and like high quality shots and stuff. So like this literally was, if this felt like a fast paced game, it was a fast paced game because you had two teams that refused to have like consistent <laughs> offensive pressure in the opponent's zone and is just break after break after break after break and rush after rush after rush. So I'm actually really glad you brought that up because that is actually a big reason why, and to give credit to the Red Wings, it's a big reason why they hung into this game is because they recognize that Derek Lillone recognized that Dallas, much like themselves, is a team that mostly yeah, scores the off the rush. Period especially, I thought that they held possession for much longer than we're used to. Or what they also were doing, and Valley Sports commented it on, it on it as well, is the neutral zone breakup is yeah. the Red Wings were much more aggressive in the neutral zone to cut down on their lanes, preventing them from even getting in the offensive zone. And that's why a team that scores as many goals as Dallas was having trouble generating goals, offensive chances um, in that second period, in the first period. In the second period, they actually they had 12 shots on net, so they did get plenty of shots. But when talking quality shots, you know, the, the Red Wings were doing a good job stifling that neutral zone entry. But my problem here is, actually, you know what? Before I get into my count, me counterpointing my point, um, let's take a quick break. I'll tell you guys about our sponsor. Um, and then we'll come back for segment two of lockdown, uh, Red Wings. 
At Lockdown Red Wings, we believe your home should be where you and your family feel safest, especially over the holidays. This season, give yourself and your family the gift of peace and protection with the number one rated home security system, Simply Safe. And right now, Simply Safe is offering Locked On Red Wings listeners 40% off a new security system. But don't put it off. Here's why you're going to love it. Simply Safe was named the best home security system of 2022 by U.S. News and World Report, a third year in a row. In an emergency, 24-7 professional monitoring agents use Fast Protect technology exclusively from Simply Safe to capture critical evidence and verify the threat is real so you can get higher priority police response. Simply Safe is whole home security with advanced sensors for every room, window, and door, HD security cameras for inside and out, smarter ways to detect motion that alert you when a threat is real, and even hazard sensors that detect fires, floods, and other threats to your home. Don't miss your chance to save big on your favorite security system. Get 50, 40% off any new system at simplysafe.com slash lockdown NHL. That's simplysafe.com slash lockdown NHL. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Segment two, Lockdown Red Wings podcast. Um, let's talk also about the fact that so the Red Wings got a point in this game, right? And that gives them five out of eight possible points on the road trip. That's two, one, and one. That's great, right? You look at that and you go, that's a, that's a successful road trip. They had one dot of a game. They won two others. One Stole one they shouldn't have. Got an OT point in a game they probably shouldn't have. They got five points. So you're sitting fifth, fourth in the Atlantic division, rather. My worry, my problem becomes, and again, the expectation this season wasn't playoffs, but they're flirting with playoffs. So we're going to. We're going to look at that and be like, okay, can they do it? The problem is, is now you're going to begin to see the separation because this Atlantic division is so deep, Scotty. It five out of eight points in this division isn't enough. And they're now they're fourth in the Atlantic division with 32 points. Tampa Bay lightning who you just played and beat two games ago now has separation between you and you and them. They put three points of difference between you and them in, in the, days since you played them that's how that's how tough this division is and i'm not trying to say that three points is insurmountable it's not that tampa bay could go on a losing streak and whatever but you're already not going to catch toronto they're at 42 points and they're going to keep getting hotter um they've caught boston who's at 43 points i mean those two teams are going to be top one and two so you're looking at a divisional spot your third spot in the division is the best spot you could possibly hope for if not wild card but if you're talking in division itself you know, that third spot's the most vulnerable, and Tampa's already put, beginning to put separation between just days after you beat them and took third place from them. So you, you took it, look at this, and you go, five out of eight points is great in a vacuum, but in this division, man, if you're not dominating your opponents, then you're talking about a wild card straight out. And for some people, that's, that's what they've been saying from the beginning, is that this division's too tough to get a divisional spot. So wild card is where it's at. But man, oh, man. Is, is that crazy that you could get five out of eight possible points on the road on the road and still fall behind the clo next closest division rival? Yeah. I, <laughs> I mean, we've been singing that tune for a minute, right? Like we've, we've been talking about that and just how, and, and like everybody has been aware of that for a couple of years now. And it hasn't really mattered because we haven't been competitive, you know, after the second month in the yeah. season for like years, but uh, it's, that's definitely a thing. And it's something that's also like not going away. Like when you look at the future of the Red Wings and you, you want to talk about, you know, where this team could be next year or the year after that, like certainly Boston, you would imagine has to like fall off eventually, but like Tampa is just a machine. Like Florida is still young and like, they're gonna, you know, figure it out. Like, I, I don't know, man, like that, this, this is say a, a and then like Toronto is is Toronto uh, like I don't know it, it, this is not a, a problem that oh like if we can just get through this like tough patch of like this year and next year then like it'll be fine like no this is like gonna be a thing for the foreseeable future um so yeah I, I it, it's that's who you have to compare yourself to you know and yeah what's crazy is too is like the Red Wings win percent or point percentage rather bless you Red Wings point percentage rather is well comfortably above 500 right now. Like they have a point percentage of 0.593. They're, they're having a good yeah. season by all accounts. Things have taken a definitive step in the right direction, which is awesome to see. 
But, you know, when you take a step in the right direction, you start to adjust your expectations and want more. We were starting to want more out of the Red Wings, which is the right, like, that's the right answer. Like, you should want more out of your team that's trending upwards in the rebuild. That's an okay thing to have, you know, keep them realistic. But the fact that a 5-9-3 point percentage has you sitting outside the second wild card spot right now, like, if you're not, if you don't have a point percentage that's well above 600, because if you look at Tampa Bay, their point percentage right now is six four eight. If you're not six fifty or above in this division, you don't have a shot in hell at making it in, in, to a divisional spot. And even look at the Rangers and the Islanders. Well, actually, their point percentages are worse than you, but they've just played more games, so they have more points than you. So, like, you can sneak into a wild card spot, you know, but no, below a six hundred point percentage. But if you, because I mean, the end goal of this rebuild obviously is to be a divisional threat. Wild card's great, and it, you know if they were to sneak in this year, I'd be celebrating because that's awesome. But it's just crazy that it really – you talk about how in segment one, third period, you're talking grand scheme of things. You want this team to be like 650 point percentage to, to compete in this division, and that is such a tall order, and I recognize that. That's crazy ask, but that's just how difficult this division is. Yeah, no, exactly, and, and – you know, that, that's more, like you said, that's more like long-term type of conversation. But even if you're just looking at a micro, microscope of just like this year, um, yeah, like that's – not that I – I don't think anyone was expecting to be a divisional threat this year. I think no, 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 that, no. That, right, that was obviously like a tall ask. But, um, you know, now you're seeing it firsthand. Like you got a Red Wings team that that post-American Thanksgiving is, is you know, is is – in the picture and in the hunt and yeah, now you're seeing, you're seeing like what we've been talking about, we're, we're seeing it with your team now, if you're a Red Wings fan. So it'll be, it'll be a really man. Like, like I said, like, it's just, it's not going to get easier. Like in a couple of years, like it's not. Um, but yeah, wild card was always, I, I think for even the people that did think we could be a playoff team, I think that was probably where, most were leaning. So, yeah, now you're seeing that live, I guess. I mean, the Boston Bruins have a point percentage of 827. Yeah, well... They've got 83% of their total points. Yeah, well, they're nuts. They're yeah. insane this year. So. Um, Let's get back to the game. We kind of transitioned naturally into a grander scope thing, but let's go back to the Dallas game and focus on that. What was Dylan Larkin doing in overtime? <laughs> yeah, man. I don't know. That was, that was it, tough. I mean... And like. Okay. The, no, like, while it was happening, you were like, oh, 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 oh. Literally. Oh. <laughs> but then, like, you saw where the puck went, and it was almost like, okay. Like, I got, <laughs> like, like, when he, like, put it into the corner, you were like, oh, okay. Like, I, like, I guess, like, that, sure. And then, oh, 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 oh. Like it was just like a roller coaster of like a 20 second stretch where you were like, no. And then you were like, oh, like, I need, like, maybe if somebody could get over there. And then it was like, no, no, no. <laughs> that, that is quite literally how it went. So the Red Wings had possession of that puck for like the entirety of the three on three, five minutes. Mm -hmm. And I saw somebody on barely had any shots, but I, well, that's what I was going to say too is I've seen, saw somebody on Twitter say like, Four on three on three overtime has now transformed into a more boring version of four on four overtime because when it first happened, it was really exciting because it was fast paced, everything going back and forth. But now teams are strategizing to just hold on to possession because you can't lose if you don't turn it over. So right. teams rarely take shots unless they have a shooting lane. And the Red Wings, I think I complained about who is the team that they just lost in overtime to most recently or a shootout to? It was like the Islanders, maybe. I can't remember, but they. They went to a shootout, but in overtime, the other team had possession of the puck the entire time and just cycled in and out of the offensive zone. And we were complaining on the podcast about how boring that was. And then the Red Wings go out and do it in this time. And so it's like clearly a strategy multiple teams are implementing to try and just only take quality scoring attempts. And I understand it, but, you know, maybe they should. And I read this on Twitter, and I can't, I can't remember who I read it from. It was just during the game. But I read it on Twitter that some, they should implement like a rule where you can't come back across like center ice. If you cross center ice, because going all the way back down, just like there, then because Dallas got the possession of the puck and Dallas was doing the same thing. And the Dallas fans were booing them too. Like the Dallas fans were booing at both teams whenever they would do that. Cause it's just like, this is so boring. But anyways, the Dylan Larkin play, I understand he was absolutely gassed when he, um, 
because he had to bust ass to get back. He made a diving play to stop one of their players from getting a breakaway. He was out of energy. He got the puck at center ice. And this is what's wild is because their formula for success in overtime is just making the safe play for him to be squared up looking at his defenseman on their blue line. And he could have made the safe pass back for him to take a risky play when their formula is just make the safe play and try to do this like fancy looking ahead backwards pass to a Ford. He thought was breaking to the boards. who had no idea that puck was meant for it him. It was crazy. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was insane. And it just turned over and they scored. Like it was such a bonehead move by Dylan Larkin, but I also understand he was really tired, but it doesn't really excuse the fact that, you know, the guy well, who you want to pay the most amount of money made the worst mistake. So to your point, like it's, I don't want to say that that play is, like a lot more excusable, I guess, in like a different situation or a different scenario. But like you had less than a minute until you were going to a shootout, like less than a minute. All you had to do was just not give up a goal in the last like 40 or 50 seconds and you're going to a shootout and you, you just won a shootout against Buffalo. Yeah. So like, like, come on. Like, what are we talking about? Like, you, you have you have less than a minute. And and like you said, you know, you have a, a much safer play. And then you have a crazy whatever the heck that was. And we chose crazy whatever the heck that was, obviously. And, and uh, not that, you know, it guaranteed cost us a point. Like, you know, who knows what happens in shootouts these you days. Get, but, you have a much better chance at getting that second point. Right. You at least no. have a chance. You at least put yourself in an opportunity to get another point. Whereas then it's like basically a coin flip at that point. Right. Whereas this one was was clearly we, we only walked away with one. So while I, I'm still very happy and pleased with walking away with one, it's definitely a, a, a tough Sour. way you're right. That's a tough pill to swallow. I like the, to end a game that way and, you know, golden goal over time. So, yeah, absolutely. It was, it was definitely surprising to see Larkin do that, but I understand it was the, at the end of a long shift and he was tired and he wanted to change. He had to just pass it back to his defenseman though. And he could have immediately got off the ice because he's right next along the boards. So there's really no excuse for the play. He just a giant mental gaff costing an yeah. extra point in this one, but on to the next one, I guess. Uh, yeah. When we come back, we'll finish up our final thoughts on this game and talk about the Elmer Soderblom situation. But first, I got to talk to you guys today about Bet Online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there, from football to basketball to soccer and esports. They've got it all at BetOnline.net. And if you love sports podcasts, you can find those at BetOnline as well. They always they're always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting fix. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet online. It's where the game starts. Segment three, locked on Red Wings podcast. Um, we got to talk about the goal scores in this one. Obviously, Larkin scored, and that one's more about the goal, how the whole play developed, as that was like the beauty, the perfect type of goal you want to score off a rush, a yeah. breakout pass from the defensive zone up to a forward, clean zone entry, carries the puck across the blue line. Zarnik comes down. He see he's waiting. Late guy comes in. Dylan Larkin, I think, off the bench. It was right in. off the bench. Yeah. Zarnik sees him, hits the late guy who releases a shot, scores. That is just textbook scoring off the rush. Leading breakout pass, clean zone entry, hit the guy breaking late. I, it was it was perfection. And at that moment when that goal was scored, I went, "We're not losing this game." I, well, I felt it in my bones. <laughs> that that certainly was a take, eh? But uh, no, that was that was a. Uh, it, it really was a beauty, and I do want to highlight Zarnik just because I think he's looked pretty darn good, and uh, over the last whatever four or five games, uh, so definitely kind of a, a hats off to him filling that bottom whatever fourth line or, or bottom six role. But yeah, it, it was a. It was a beauty. It really was. And the shot from Larkin was a laser. And yeah, it, it was a really, really pretty play to watch. It was. And uh, I mean, Zarnik is part of the reason why I think Elmer Soderblom got sent down to the AHL. Um, yeah. To be honest, because, and we can just transition to that. I do want to give a shout out to David Perron getting that deflection goal on game number 1,000. Congratulations Mr. 1K, to him. baby. It was a nice little deflect by him. They but end up giving him the goal? 
Yep, they did. It was clearly off his stick. I mean, I okay, saw it on the first I replay. I'm like, how did they the get game, this they were like, oh, it might be Sharats or something. No, nah, give that goal to Perron. It went off his stick. It was so clear. I don't understand yeah, yeah. where the confusion was. But Elmer Soderblom got activated off the IR finally, and he got sent down to Grand Rapids. And I think this is about as much about Austin Zarnik's play as it is about Elmer Soderblom's. I think both of those, both of their plays, obviously Soderblom was hurt, but prior to getting hurt, are into why Elmer got sent down because Elmer Soderblom's play offensively, you know, he had the ability to create some chances, but defensively he left a lot left to be desired. He really needs to work on his 200, uh, 200 foot game. And I think going down to grand Rapids is the best place to do it. he was starting on the top line for them. In fact, in yesterday's game. And so I think that Elmer Soderblom going down to Grand Rapids was the right decision for his development. He, he was fantastic in training camp. He came out to start the season and was hot, but then quickly you noticed that he was struggling to really fully adjust once the I'm right. in the NHL. Oh crap. Adrenaline was gone. Once he started to settle down, it became clear. He still had to do some things to work on being an NHL player, but Austin Zarnick in the meantime, when Elmer got injured, Zarnick has come up and been more, than a replacement level player, in my opinion, on that fourth line. He, his chemistry with Valeno and Bergen and that fourth line in general has been really, really good. He's got two points in the last like four games, which I know is like, oh, only two in the last four, but it's a fourth line player. Like you're not going to get a lot of uh, points out of those guys. And that goal doesn't happen against Dallas if it's not for the vision Zarnik had to hit Larkin breaking late. Yeah, no, I mean, he he's definitely looked great. I, I also don't think that it's entirely like 100%, oh, you know, Zarnik has been like cut and dry better than what Elmer was doing. I, I think that like we, we see fairly often, you know, teams will almost like a like a rehab assignment, quote unquote, right? Like yeah, you're, you're sending him still. down there just to, you know, he hasn't played hockey in what a month. So like you send him down to the AHL, let him get his uh, his legs back under him. Let him get sharp again, and then call him back up. I, I'm yep. not sure it's it's a hundred percent like it's that black and white. Like I don't know if it's like oh, like in this moment, Zarnik is absolutely better than Elmer, and that's all there is to it. I think it's it's probably just wanting to to ease a young kid with that much body back into uh, back into the mix. But yeah, no, I, it it is nice to see. I mean, we talk about the depth so often with this team, and it is really nice to see that even with all these injuries that have been happening and, and all these things going on that uh, we continue to have almost like a next man up mentality where like, you know, wh whoever's going to get called up now is, is able to, to produce when put in the right situation too. And that's, uh, that, that's really refreshing a, but also if you're trying to put together a competitive hockey team, that's what good teams do. So I think you raise a wonderful point too about the whole conditioning stint thing. Cause he's been gone off the, you know, hasn't played an NHL game in weeks, weeks. And right. so and if you have someone you know, who's like waiver exempt, <laughs> right, right. Well, you, uh, I mean like in Zarnik, like if you have someone that's producing, that's filling in his role, then yeah. Why would you not take it slowly? Like there's no point in rushing him if you're getting production out of the, the player that's taking his spot currently. Yeah. So, I mean, and there's no rush to Elmer Soderblom being an NHL-ready player anyways. I don't yeah. think anyone expected him to make the roster coming out of his, what, rookie season in the uh, SHL. He had a fantastic year, and he was a sixth-round pick. So, he can take his time and get ready. So, even if this, is, this isn't a conditioning stint for him, and he is down in the Grand Rapids to work on his game, like I think he probably may be, that's fine. Right. Like, you don't even have to be a Red Wing this year, in my opinion. I yeah, feel like it wasn't expected yeah. to before the preseason. <laughs> like take your time, get your game right. Yeah. I think he's, he's, it's he's definitely a, 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 yeah, definitely like a slow, you know, marination season. Yeah, absolutely. Um, also one last shout out, Ben Sherratt and Moritz Sider actually had a good game as a pair in this game against that. Yeah, I thought Sherratt looked pretty good. Yeah. They both finished well above uh, their expected goals. Four percentage was 63 and 61% respectively. But if you just want to look at Corsi and just look at shot attempts, like straight up 50% for Moritz Sider, 54% for Ben Sherratt. Third on the team, as usual, Phil Peronic continues to be one of the best players at preventing scoring chances and creating them from the back end for the Detroit Red Wings. Every single game, even when the ones they no lose, way. he's always near the top. 
man, his his rebirth has been, and this is without Olimata, both games without Olimata, he's still been near the top. So when you want to talk about like, oh, it's because Mata's a safety net, without Olimata, he's still, you know, percentage wise, create getting more creating more shooting attempts than giving up shooting attempts, which is just like, who is this guy? Where was he last year? I don't know. But I Doesn't like the matter. pairs. He's here now, baby. He's here now, for sure. I like the pairs a lot better today. Um, it was Wolman with Heronic, which I was like, I wonder how that's going to turn out. Two guys who like to skate and shoot the puck. I thought that was interesting. And then Osterle with Lindstrom. So, I honestly, anything that's not Hag and Lindstrom. So, that, yeah, they're better pairs. Better pairs, for sure. For sure. Defense played a bit better. But uh, that's going to – that's about does it. Any, any final thoughts, man? Uh, one pride, baby. As y'all are listening to this, you know the results of the game, but the push is on. One pride, and uh, we ball. You realize, even if they win all five games, they only have like a seventy-five percent chance of making it. Did you say only seventy-five percent chance of making it when talking yeah. about the Detroit Lions? I would <laughs> rob a bank for that. If they win four out of the next five, they have a sixty-nine percent chance. That's nice. That's nice. A nice but, <laughs> we'll be back with a new episode tomorrow and a game preview as they play on Tuesday against the Carolina Hurricanes. Um, same time, same place. It's your team every day. Every day. But I like.